Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders, Thomas Ward. Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Some Dude 267, Long Sight Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Arthur Roy Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsune 131 232, Mr. Black Rose, and Tribal Typhoon. You are the reason why this content remains somewhat of a disappointment. And today we have another top five list, and I've decided to get creative again and talk about something a bit more, shall we say, disappointing. With us locomotives, there's always disappointments. Rolling stock you expect to do so well, looking at it, it's ambitious and exciting, and it just doesn't turn out the way you want it to. Not necessarily because they're bad, but because of other reasons beyond the locomotive's control. These are five revolutionary locomotives that failed miserably. The Virginian EL-C. Sometimes called the New Haven EF-4, or just the E-33, these electric locomotives look a little peculiar, actually, because, frankly, they just look like high hood units, except they've got big old pantographs on their heads. But these were electric locomotives, and they were designed to run off pantograph lines. Constructed in 1955 by General Electric, they were the first successful production locomotives to use Ignitron rectifier technology. Their Mercury Arc. And they were astonishingly successful. They were designed for freight service, as they were modeled off of hood units, as you can see, and were capable of 65 miles per hour, 104.6 kilometers per hour, with a power output of 3,300 horsepower, which was incredible for the mid-50s. But that brings up the burning question. If they're so good, then why didn't they do well? Only 12 were ever produced. Well, that's because they were built for freight service, as electrics. The vast majority of electrification along America's rail lines is very restricted to passenger lines or regional service. The freight companies in America just simply don't have electrification for the most part. There were some exceptions, of course, as there were some buyers for them. The E-33 just failed to capture any interest simply because it would require the company to invest extra money into electrifying their lines. Why on earth would they do that when EMD was pumping out diesel electric hood units left and right didn't require the extra investment of electrifying the lines. That being said, those that did give them a chance, like the Virginian Railway and the New Haven Railway, like them quite a lot. They are good locomotives. When New Haven merged into Penn Central, and then the freight portion of Penn Central became part of Conrail, Conrail wound up using the 10 remaining E-33s until March of 1981, when Conrail shut down all its electric freight operations and restricted itself to simply just diesel. The E-33s were actually sent back to General Electric as trade-ins, and two did wind up being preserved. Originally, ex-Virginian number 131, which is painted as Conrail 4601, was sent to the Railroad Museum of New England, but recently they sold it in 2015 to the Illinois Railway Museum, where she resides today. And ex-Virginian number 135 is currently at the Virginia Museum of Transportation. It's a shame these locomotives never caught on, as they really did demonstrate the potential for electrifying freight service. But adding pantograph lines does require a lot of extra money, so I totally understand the company's point of view on the subject. And speaking of electric units that failed flat on their face... The General Electric E60. Oh, the E60s. I have brought these up actually multiple times, but never went into detail about them. Another electric outing by General Electric between 1972 and 1983, they were produced in several variants for both freight and passenger service. Now, as freight units, again, they were restricted due to the location of pantograph lines and the lack of electrification on America's railways, but they were actually okay as freight units. As passenger units under Amtrak, though, oh, oh no. There was a small itsy bitsy problem when modifying them for passenger service. See, there's a lot more that goes into designing a locomotive than you might realize, namely in terms of making sure that it's, say, stable. Amtrak wanted the E60s because they needed to replace the electric locomotives they were currently using for the electrified portion of the Northeast Corridor. The Bud Metro liners just didn't work, they were terrible, and the GG1s were simply old. They either had to rebuild all of them or replace them with a new locomotive. It would be way cheaper to invest in something new that might last longer, rather than rebuild the aging GG1s. 
At the time, there weren't any manufacturers in the United States that had a dedicated electric passenger locomotive in its catalog. General Electric were the ones who suggested creating a passenger version of the E60, because at that time, it was only meant for freight service. Initially, they ordered 26, and then later another 11 by the end of 1973. The total cost of the order was $18.4 million, and there was a high hopes for them. They were already proven in freight service, and Amtrak anticipated that eventually the E60s could completely take over all the electrified lines on their network. However, General Electric failed to take something relatively important into account. And that's that freight trains are very, very, very heavy. The E60s were designed with this in mind. The extra weight behind them actually worked to keep the locomotive stable. But when they adapted for passenger service, where the trains are much, much lighter, it was found the E60s had serious stability issues. They had a habit of swaying badly sideways while they were accelerating, which put stress on both the locomotive and the rails. But on top of that, one derailed on February 24th, 1975, and the National Transportation Safety Board investigated revealing problems with their trucks and bolster design. The locomotives were simply designed for carrying much more weight to keep them stable. With the way their trucks were, the lack of significant weight behind them meant they had a tendency to want to fly off the rails. As a result of this, the Federal Railroad Administration restricted their speed to 85 miles per hour. Amtrak continued to use them because they had little other option, and publicly expressed confidence that they could fix the issues, but at the same time, they arranged for a trial of the Swedish-built four-axle RC4. The RC4, as we've talked about before, would later be adapted into the American-made EMD AEM-7s. The AEMs were much, much better. Amtrak did retain a handful for limited use, mostly for heavy, long-distance trains, where the weight was enough of a factor so as not to cause problems for the E60s. But they only needed a few of them for that, and they were retired from Amtrak by 2003. But when applied to the correct train, they're actually still pretty good. Some are still in service in various capacities, such as on the Deseret Western Railway. Three remain in preservation, and the rest were scrapped. The London Northeastern Railway Class W1 Number 10,000, also known as the Hush Hush because it was a super secret project. Originally built by Darlington Works in 1929, under the direction and oversight of the legendary Sir Nigel Gresley. What on earth could have gone wrong here? It's Grizzly! He very rarely did anything that was completely catastrophic, and to be fair, the W1 wasn't catastrophic. It just didn't do what it was supposed to do. The W1 is a high-pressure steam locomotive, which we've discussed in the past when we talked about the Fury. But unlike the Fury, the W1 never really had any cataclysmic failures that got anybody killed. It was designed fairly well in terms of containing the high-pressure steam, unlike the Fury, which could operate with a boiler pressure up to 1,800 pounds per square inch, like a crazy person. The W1 was high-pressure only in the loosest of sense. Its boiler pressure was only 450 psi, which is still high enough to be high-pressure, but not so cataclysmic that it could explode at any waking moment. You've also probably noticed it has a very interesting design that does nothing but remind me of a beluga whale because it's got this bulgy, fat boiler-looking thing going on. But that was partially because it used something called a three-drum boiler, which is a boiler with an arrangement where the steam drum is set above two water drums in a triangular layout. The water tubes fill the two sides of this triangle between the drums, and the furnace is in the center. The ethos behind the three-drum boiler was actually meant to make it very compact, as well as operate at a bit of a higher pressure, which is perfect for a steam locomotive, although the only large three-drum boiler that was ever used in a locomotive was in the W1. But with an ambitious design, a more baby steps outlook on getting to high-pressure steam, and the legendary Sir Nigel Gresley behind it, how on earth could the W1 fail? Well, it just never steamed very well. No matter what they did, it never reached the standards of an equivalent fire tube boiler. It also suffered from air leakage into the casing, which was an issue that was simply never solved at any point. Eventually, Grizzly decided that no further progress could be made. It was taken to Doncaster Works and given a conventional boiler with three simple expansion cylinders on the normal Grizzly layout. It was given a slightly modified A4 boiler, and to an untrained eye, it wound up looking just like an A4, except A4s are 462 Pacifics. When they modified the W1, they actually let her keep her additional axle. She was a 464, technically a Hudson. 
This allowed them to give her a more spacious cab for the crew, and with a more conventional design, she actually ran very well for many years. British Railways would take over later, and renumbered her to 6700. She stuck around till the 1st of June 1959, when she was finally broken up for scrap. Although one of her tenders, number 5484, actually did survive into preservation. It's currently attached to number 4488, Union of South Africa, which is one of the six surviving A4s. So that's something, anyway. The British Rail Class 71. For the love of all that is holy, how many times do I have to tell you to get out of my house? Where are you going? No, where are you going? Get back here! Get back here! I've had enough of you! What? What? Are you running for? Are you scared? Are you scared of me? I'm gonna go full American Revolution on you! I've had just about enough of this nonsense! British Rail Class 71 was built as a part of the British Transport Commission's modernization plan of 1955 because of course it was! They were pure electric locomotives, and they were used on the southern region of British Railways. Prior to the TOPS classification scheme, they were actually called the HAs, but most people called them the 71s. And despite my frustrations with British Rail, I must admit that the 71s are actually very good. Built between 1958 and 1960, their reliability was considered quite good, especially for that time, and their acceleration was extraordinary. The climb up the grade out of London Victoria was apparently almost unnoticeable. They could also handle freight trains very well, and really showed the potential of electric locomotives on the rail lines. So, why are they even on this list then? Well, in a similar case to the E33s, at that time, the southern region didn't have that many exclusive electrified lines. There wound up being other locomotive types, like the Class 33, or the smaller Class 73s, that may not have been as powerful, efficient, or agile, but were either just straight-up diesels, or electro-diesels. They could do both. The pure electric nature of Class 71 restricted it in the southern region very badly. They did have flywheel boosters that allow the locomotives to make short movements off the juice, as they say, in yards and depots, but outside of that, they had to stay attached to an electric line. And since they wanted them on freight trains, a lot of the freight trains are moved overnight, when there aren't that many passenger trains clogging up the lines. This made it even worse because even on the electrified portions of the southern region's lines, engineering and maintenance work tends to be done overnight. And for safety reasons, the power is, of course, switched off. So Class 71, even when it was used, often had to take ridiculous detours around sections that were being worked on, where diesels would normally be able to pass through just fine because it needed to have the electric lines. By the time they were withdrawn between 1976 and 1977, many were still in full working order, but 13 were still scrapped anyway. One wound up being saved by the National Railway Museum in York, and is currently on display at National Railway Museum Shildon. It's been restored as E5001. The other 10 were actually converted into Class 74 electro diesels, which is hysterical to me because the Class 74s appeared on my top 5 worst trains ever list before because they were given new electronic interfaces that never worked properly. Oh goodness, never change British Rail. The Pennsylvania Railroad Class S1. Bear witness to this unyielding power. The S1, which was nicknamed the Big Engine, was a single example of an experimental duplex locomotive by the Pennsylvania Railroad. It is also the longest and heaviest rigid frame reciprocating steam locomotive that was ever constructed. With a unique 6446 wheel arrangement, it was completed at the Altoona shops on January 31st, 1939, and was numbered 6100. And this thing was just insane. Not only was it the longest reciprocating steam locomotive ever, it had the heaviest tender at 451,840 pounds, the highest tractive effort of a passenger steam engine of that era, and the largest drivers ever used on a locomotive with more than three coupled axles. They were 84 inches in diameter. This thing was massive and stupidly powerful. It had a gorgeous streamlined design, and its top speed is questionable at best. No one's really sure how fast it really could have gone had it been pushed. There were speed restrictions in the area of that time. But rumor has it the S1 beat the Mallard's speed record on multiple occasions, simply unofficially. The fastest it was ever rumored to have gone was 156 miles per hour, or 251 kilometers per hour, on the Fort Wayne Chicago run. 
It was reported that Pennsylvania Railroad actually received a fine for this particular feat, because steam trains were not supposed to go that fast under any circumstances. As a showpiece and a demonstrator for the potential of steam locomotives in the future, the S1 could be argued to be quite successful. It was displayed at the New York World's Fair of 1939 and 1940, and popular mechanics once described the S1 as the pride of American Railroad, in an article of their June 1939 issue. People liked it! It was an impressive engine, and riding on it was apparently a wonderful experience. So why wasn't it more successful? Well, the S1 was designed and built in tandem with the T1, my favorite locomotive type ever, which was also a duplex, except that the S1 was not only larger, but also twice the cost of a T1. The S1 also had the problem of being simply too big. Yeah, it was powerful and fast, sure, but it couldn't negotiate track clearances on most of the lines of the Pennsylvania Railroad system. It was restricted only to the main line between Chicago, Illinois, and Crestline, Ohio. Though, in her defense, the Pennsylvania Railroad used her as much as they could. Monthly mileage reports state that the S1 managed to hit over 10,000 miles in August of 1941, which was an amazing monthly mileage figure for an experimental engine, especially when you compare it to the more commonly known K4s that only average 6,000 to 8,000 miles monthly. The S1 also helped a lot for the busier and heavier wartime traffic until the end of World War II, and was able to pay off her high construction costs within one year. Crews loved her, as she was very smooth riding, and her aforementioned speed was not to be questioned. She wasn't perfect, as it was suspected she had a bit of a design flaw, as less than half of her total weight was actually on her driving wheels, 47%. The other 53% was on the six-wheel pilot and trailing trucks. It was believed she was susceptible to wheel slippage, but during her five and a half years in service, no serious accident happened because of wheel slippage, and the crews never really mentioned anything like this. Pennsylvania Railroad did make some modifications, such as in a large sand dome, to try to limit the wheel slip issue if it did crop up, but despite her great size making it so that she was very limited on what lines she could operate on, she was considered an excellent steamer and caused the crew very little trouble. Despite how incredible the S1 was, she was never able to do what she was meant to do. She ran her last run sometime in 1946. It was internally discussed in the Pennsylvania Railroad that they wanted to preserve the S1, but the deteriorating financial situation since 1946 meant that they couldn't justify letting all that delicious scrap metal go to waste. And sadly, S1 number 6100 was sent to the scrapyard in 1949. It's a shame to lose such a beauty of the rails, built ahead of her time and gone before her time. And until next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.